Is there any way to ascertain what Putin's aims are? I mean, I I find it because like you mentioned, there's like there, it just seems that it's it's like now they're in this situation. So what are they going to do next? Let's say they do take Ukraine. Well, what does that mean? Like, well, exactly. what's the what's the point of doing this whole thing? So it's it's that's what's confounding to me because I don't think that Putin or any of the individuals involved in making the decisions to do this are unaware of this. It just I don't know. It's 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 baffling to me. Um, I, I, I guess maybe yeah. Sorry, go on. No, go ahead. I, I should probably let you tell ask a whole question. I'll just say there seems to be very much an ideological component, a deep ideological component that overrides the kind of rational, you know, thinking of consequences aspect to this. That seems to be what's happening, but I, I, I don't know. I'll ask if that's what you think as well. I think that there's a lot to that. I think that there's a number of aspects to how that's happened. I think, yes, that's correct. Um, but it's not just ideology. I mean, let me let me back up. I think that what has happened with Putin, and I mean, I know that they say this stuff on the mainstream press, but I have a little bit of a different take on it. I mean, what's happened to Putin has happened historically to many leaders, right? That That voices that they have historically counted on as being sort of moderating voices, moderate, you know, uh, well, maybe you should be cautious about this and maybe you shouldn't do that and whatever. Those voices have been sidelined for various reasons, some of which are political, some of which are personal, some of which who knows what, right? But a lot of those voices, they are not, they do not have Putin's ear right now as they did say seven, eight, nine years ago. Um, and part of the part of the uh and, and i mean we know this right it's this is not some secret right this is very well known in russia for example general ivashov who is one of the i mean the May, most famous main general of the of recent times in Russia. He was the head of the National Security Council. He was one of the highest ranking one of the highest ranking people in Russia. And this is somebody who three weeks ago or four weeks ago now wrote an op ed in the Russian in mainstream Russian press com, uh, calling for Putin's resignation over mm -hmm. what he was doing with Ukraine, over the buildup with Ukraine, and saying that this was insane, that this was suicidal. You know that this is this is not. You know, that even if you wanted to strike back at NATO, that this would not be the way to do it, that this was mm -hmm. going to be a disaster, right? And this is, again, this is Ivashov. This is somebody who was at the center of the regime for a long time. So, uh, you know, this is not like, it's not like there weren't people who were saying that this was a disaster waiting to happen. But I believe that what we're actually witnessing, to some extent at least, is sort of the, as you mentioned it, kind of an ideological capture of Putin by the Eurasianists. And that would be Alexander Dugin and his protégés and people like that who, for various reasons, have, it seems, become much more influential with regard to foreign policy. And I want to just back up and give a quick parallel because this is really, I think it'll help illustrate what I'm talking about. Dugin if you don't know who Alexander Dugin is, Alexander Dugin is a is a influential philosopher and political operator. I would say mostly political operator uh, in Russia, who was uh, connected to and a protege of Eduard Limonov. He was connected to the National Bolshevik movement and so forth. Anyway, he's a fascist. Okay, he's a fascist who essentially um, he he's he uh, he's an exponent of what's called Eurasianism, which is basically Russian imperialism that sees Russia as the great land power of the Eurasian landmass, and as the great land power of the Eurasian landmass, Russia should, in in its natural state, control Eurasia from Lisbon to Vladivostok. In other words, this is this is the widest possible vision of Russian imperialism. Right. And this is the idea that uh, Russia is this sort of historic actor that while the Atlantic powers control the seas, Russia controls the land. Right. And that Russia historically, whether you want to go back to the, uh, you know, the uh, the founding of modern Russia and move it all the way forward to the Mongol invasions and then all the way into the Russian imperial period, that Russia was always this power. Right. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so. That Russia Russia should regain that status, that power, right? And how is this to be done? 
You know, this is the question. How do you do this? I believe that Dugan and his cohorts, um, they took a tremendous amount of inspiration and have a lot of admiration for neocons, for the neoconservative movement in the United States. And they look at what the neocons did. These are non-military men who are ideologues. They are book guys, not war guys. And they took control of the foreign policy of the most powerful global empire in history for 40 years, nearly. Mm -hmm. And were able to steer the ship of empire to their own ends, Mm -hmm. irrespective of international law, irrespective of Europe, irrespective of anything other than what they wanted to do. In other words, true power politics in the game of empire right and so what the what dugan and ultimately putin seem to have taken from them is what carl rove talked about years ago in his famous quote where he said and i'm paraphrasing it where he said that we are the actors of history that we create realities that everyone else must live within in other words, that you use the power of empire to shape events on the ground. Events on the ground bend to your will, not to international law, not to anything else, to your power. That is that is the essence of neoconservative ideology. If you read anybody from you know Irving Kristol on forward to Dick Cheney and Don Rumsfeld and all of them, they view imperial power in this way. They don't use that term, but that is what it is. So Dugin and the Russians essentially see this and copy it. And that is that is what you're seeing in Ukraine. So take a take, you know, take a take a step back and look at the timeline here, the build up, the build up to the war in Ukraine. What is Ukraine? Ukraine is an imminent security threat. Ukraine is a security threat. It's three uh three days before the war, uh, and then again after the war starts. Putin gets on on TV in Russia speaking to the entire nation and he says we have to act to prevent Ukraine from developing their nuclear weapon. Right? Mm. So it goes on and on. You could point to a number of other examples of how they have essentially copied what the US was doing in the post 9/11 period, it leading into the invasion of Iraq, and they have basically imported it into Ukraine. So Putin creates realities. Putin Mm -hmm. acts and the world responds, right? Mm -hmm. And so part of this is this sort of constructing of, 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 of reality on the ground. And part of it is rooted in this sort of imperial revanchism. And that then gets us to Putin's other speech from a few days ago, uh, where he made the case, I guess it was a week ago now, where he made the case to the Russian people that Ukraine, uh, was a conspiracy. You know, that Ukraine was a conspiracy by Lenin and the Bolsheviks, that Lenin and the Bolsheviks foisted Ukraine onto Russia, that Ukraine doesn't really exist. It was a creation of those dastardly Bolsheviks. You know, they're all Jews, right? Anyway, Uh, the Bolsheviks, the Bolsheviks created Ukraine. Lenin created Ukraine. There's no, there's nothing natural about Ukraine. This is what Putin says. This is what he said in his speech. It was a virulently anti-communist speech that basically blames Lenin for creating Ukraine and destroying the empire. And of course, it's absurd because it's actually one of the great breakthroughs that Lenin made, right? Because Lenin, after the revolution, realized that, hey, Russian empire is bad. We don't want to continue the Russian empire. What we want is to give the right of self-determination to the peoples of the Russian empire. Right. So, so the creation of what we now call Ukraine is rooted in the Bolshevik idea that they should not be subjugating the people of the Russian Empire the way the czars did. They didn't want to be czars. They didn't want to control the Russian Empire. They wanted to give people the right of self-determination. Now, obviously, there's there's debates about that and whether Lenin, you know, whatever. And I can't get into all of yeah, the minutia of all of that. The point sure. is, the point is that Lenin had this breakthrough. It was actually one of the aspects of how he was kind of a visionary in that way, because he understood that from the period of 1848 and the revolutions of 1848, the so-called spring of nationalisms, all the way through 1917, you're talking, you know, three, two thirds of a century, three quarters of a century, that whole period 
leading up to international sort of proletarian revolution, what are you supposed to do as, as a communist leading the revolution? Inherit the empire? or allow the people to have self-determination. And they went with the latter, and that's what's unforgivable to Russian imperialists. Russian imperialists don't recognize Ukraine because Ukraine cannot exist within a Russian imperial mindset. Hmm. And so ultimately, yeah. that that's part of the issue here, is that Ukraine is in some senses a a country that was constructed from multiple different peoples. Right and and peoples who had been subsumed by the Russian Empire, so that's why you have in the west of Ukraine virulently anti-Russian, much more sympathetic to fascism, and the heart of where the Nazi collaboration movement was occurring around the city of you know Lvov and you know uh, uh, mm -hmm. the the Zakarpatia and the western portion of Ukraine, and historically the western portion of Ukraine was not Russian. That was uh, originally it was Polish. It was Polish Lithuanian and uh, the Polish Lithuanian Empire, followed by uh, the independent Poland. And eventually, independent Poland didn't exist after World War One. So you know, again, this 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 region has gone back and forth between various empires: the Habsburgs, the Polish Lithuanian, the Russian, uh, and then let's not forget the Ottomans, who also control pieces of Ukraine. So, um, or what we now call Ukraine. So anyway, I, I say all of this to just point out the fact that the, Ru the Putin's perspective and understanding of Ukraine is a Russian imperial understanding of Ukraine, wherein the eastern portion of Ukraine is Russia. Hmm. Right. And so that is one of the, I mean, among many, that is one of the central issues here and one that he made very clear in that speech. Hmm. Yeah, I think in the U.S. American mind, it's hard to understand this thing that you're mentioning here with with the Soviet legacy, Lenin, and uh, Putin's attitude towards that, right? That somehow a modern Russian leader would not be, um, that they would have almost an anti-Leninist, anti-Soviet, anti-communist attitude in regards to its its general stance on uh like Ukraine, right? It's I think there was a poll, I don't know how accurate this is, but it seemed true to me that if you were to ask most Americans, is Russia capitalist? Is it communist? Whatever, se several other categories. Most Americans think that Russia is communist, which it is not contemporarily at least. <laughs> Right. So it's no. this general like misunderstanding of what Putin is in relation to what the Soviet Union was in great part. Right. Yeah. And, you know, the idea that you get from like MSNBC chatterheads or whatever is talking about how, well, you know, he wants to reconstitute the Soviet Union. It's a it's just an it's just not understanding anything about Putin or about the Soviet right. Union or much of anything really. It's reconstituting the Russian Empire. That's what it is. It, the mm -hmm. Soviet Union is is you know a creation of a set of 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 political and economic conditions that 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 prevailed in the early 20th century that you know the revolution which led to the civil war which led to you know there, there's a whole historical right. sure. uh set of factors that created the soviet union in the way that it was created and then eventually of course consolidated under the sort of iron-fisted rule of stalin but in the early days that's that's not what the soviet union was but anyway, yeah, it is it's it's Russian imperialism, right? And and this goes hand in hand with the reactionary right-wing politics, right? And this is you see this both in, you know, the reemergence of Russian imperialism which goes hand in hand with the re-establishment and predominance of the Russian Orthodox Church. And the Russian Orthodox Church was historically the one of the more potent weapons that was used by the Tsar, and Putin himself has used it to no end. And this is both uh, for political reasons as well as social and cultural reasons. And so you have, uh, I mean, the Russian Orthodox Church is an extremely reactionary church where they talk about, you know, various uh, anti-Semitic conspiracies and all kinds of stuff that emanates from there, right? And this is now very much uh, uh, a 
a fundamental aspect of contemporary Russia, and that is very much Putin's doing. And the reason, you know, somewhat understandably, I guess, in the post-Soviet period, one needed to somehow unite the country around a, uh, you know, some unifying ideology where 75 years of it was communism. Right, the the uh, the unifying ideology was the Communist Party and communism in the Soviet Union, right? And now that's gone. So what do you have to unite people and to you know to give people a shared collective experience or whatever? The church, but the church in Russia is just awful. I mean, they are like like fascists, fascistic in every way imaginable, you know. So anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, the okay. point is, the point is that when you look at Putin and you look at Dugin and you look at the people who are actually shaping and crafting Russian policy, uh, what you find is that these are not realists. These are not pragmatists. These are not, you know, straight up uh, international relations, you know, PhDs or anything like that. These are ideologues who are bent on carrying out an ideological worldview. And that's really dangerous because for a long time, we've all understood, I certainly did, I understood Putin, Putin as being a realist, as somebody who was very, you know, calculating in, in, in risk averse yeah. and, and looking yeah. at things in a very cold and calculating way. And now what we're seeing is something very different. And that's worrying because that opens up a whole host of really dangerous possibilities. Mm-hmm. 